Okay, good morning. Happy New Year. All those good salutations for uh, this new year, 2024. So, um, going to give this a shot. Used to do lives all the time, if you remember, back in the day, which was only, what, a year ago, two years ago. But I don't know why I got away from them, but for some reason I did. I think it's because I was doing uh, just so many videos during the week. Um, but I've come to learn, and I should have known this because I've applied it to my life, is that it's uh, quality, not quantity. So if you see a downtick in videos, that is why. So this morning I get up, if you guys don't know, I've been having this trouble with my right eye. I don't know if you can see it there, but uh, it's been puffy and swollen and sometimes it gets black under there. If you go back and look at some of my other videos, you'll see that it almost looks like I got in a fight and that'd be a cool story to tell, you know, but the fact of the matter is I don't know what the problem is nor do the doctors. I was just at the doctors again yesterday. It's been going on for a year and a half and I just keep getting a run around. Nobody can figure out why my eye when I wake up in the morning is swelled. So I come here imperfect for you looking like the elephant man because in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter what you look like. Um, I feel that the people that get caught up on that are probably not the best people on the inside anyhow. So we're not here for looks. I've always said that. We're here for content. So we're going to get started after I take a drink of this new drink that I've been making. I got a, an espresso machine for Christmas, which was very nice. And... When I was on the job working, I'd go to the coffee shop and I'd always get a shot of espresso in my coffee. But today I decided I'm going to do some hot chocolate with a shot of espresso. It's quite good. I would recommend that. Now, to the trusty binder we go. This is the binder, the unsolved no more secrets. Today's agenda, True Detective Talk Live, will be the true crime topic, none other than cold cases. That's my specialty, so that's what we're going to start the new year off with. We'll talk about how they become cold, why there's so many cold cases, uh, how to solve the cold cases, how to move cases forward, everything cold cases, okay? An historical cold case that we're going to look at today. I've done many videos on this case, and I have written down here the Ketty murders. Talk a little bit about that. Um, I mean, there isn't much more that I can cover that I haven't already covered, but we'll talk about it nonetheless. Any topic that I want. Um, Today, let's, let's talk some Leonard Skinnerd just for the heck of it, even though I have a Guns N' Roses shirt on. Let's do a little bit of Leonard Skinnerd. And lastly, the person that I would like to interview, we're going to go with Theodore Robert Bundy, better known as Ted Bundy. And we'll get into why that is. And, and I've done some videos, obviously, on, on Mr. Ted. And we'll discuss him a little bit today. So, let's start off with what I was doing last night. Um, after I got bounced around from doctor to doctor to doctor, as always. Um, is it me or does, does it just feel like, I don't know. I mean, most of the people that are watching this, I'm assuming are retired because of the time of the day and a weekday. 
Um, so you're probably my age or older. Doesn't it just seem that health care, like the doctors or whatnot, were maybe more efficient or maybe just, I, I hate to say, more professional, more customer service oriented? I mean, can you believe that for in the year and a half that I've been going to the doctor in regards to my eye problem, and I mean, I'm sure you can see it. It's not so bad this morning, but um, not one doctor has physically touched my eye. Now, I remember like 20 years ago, a doctor would be pushing on my eye trying to see, hey, does that hurt? It's like they're afraid to do anything. It's like it's, you know, yesterday the guy never got within five feet of me. I, was, I sat in a chair. He sat over another chair with a barrier in between us, you know, the the actual place where you the patient's supposed to sit. And he had his laptop on that, and he just asked me questions, never looked at me, typed. Then he got done, asked me like three questions, and then said, I'll be back. We're going to go discuss this. Comes back and says, there's nothing we can do for you here. And I, I just, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't agitated. I was like, yeah, well, I sort of figured that. But it just seems like there's so, everybody is so non-professional. And they're just, I don't know. Now, and I noticed it not just with me. I've been going to a lot of uh, of my father's because he's sick as well. Um, been going to a lot of his doctor's appointments. And they seem just to want to get you in, get you out. And, you know, my dad, you know, on the drive home will be like, you know, I don't know what that was about. You know, they didn't even do it, didn't tell me anything. And I say, Dad... Nobody, none of these doctors care. And that's how I really feel. They don't, and I, I feel this way about per, almost any vocation. They don't really care about you personally. It's a job to them. And they see so many people that it's just, you're just a number. You know, much like I was when I was in the police department and when I decided to to leave. You know, everybody's like, oh, you can't do that. That's that's crazy. I'm like, listen, you're just a number. That, that's all you are. Everybody, think of football. Jerry Rice, probably the greatest receiver of all time. San Francisco lets him go. He goes to Oakland. And from Oakland, he goes to... Seattle or wherever he finishes his career, he's just a number. When he left San Francisco, how are you going to replace him? Well, they had this guy named Ter Terrell Owens. I mean, everybody's replaceable. Now, Terry Bradshaw with the Steelers, that's a, that's a different story, right? Terry Bradshaw was replaced by Mark Malone. Not so good, but the point is, everybody's replaceable. You're just a number to these doctors. That's how I feel. Very few, but it's like that in any vocation. And again, it's like that, you can correlate that to true crime. And YouTube people or whatever, and detectives. There's some that are do it just because it's a job. They don't care about you. They don't care about the case. But there's others. You know, there's a select few that do. That's the people that you want to gravitate towards. Those are the doctors I want to see. Um, so I don't know. It seems like that to me in, in restaurants as well. Sometimes it just feels like there's no personality there. It's just, I don't know. It seems like it, customer service is a lost art. I think because of social media and the internet and call me crazy. It's my thought, my opinion, my channel that because of social media, people have become less connected and become not so personable because you can do everything behind a a mask you know that's my thoughts on that so boy 
I did digress, but I'm not really digressing because in these lives, I'm going to talk about whatever I want to talk about. It's just the way it is. It's not a professional type of video per se. Uh, cold cases. So anybody who, you know, is watching this obviously knows my background and my passion. And, and that's what it is. Cold cases have always been my passion since I was a, a teenager watching Unsolved Mysteries with my dad, um, probably before 14, probably, well, 13. And to be now doing cool case stuff and being in this field for a decade or so, um, it's really special. It really is to me to be able to do this for a living. And before I was doing this, actually working on cold cases for the district attorney's office, and before that, a police department. Although that was, you know, a handful of them. I mean, that's what our county had. So, I mean, I had to do, it wasn't like we were in New York, but it doesn't matter. Again, it's quality, not quantity. But I learned a lot about cold cases, and I learned that the reason cold cases become cold is because of various reasons. One being leads dry up. So what I mean by that is when you first break open, and I, well, they become cold because you have an active homicide, and in the first 48 hours, first five days, you're really hammering it. Now, I never worked uh, as a lead investigator on a homicide. I was always the helper because you always had these older detectives, people that I looked up to at the time. And now that I am removed 20 years from that or whatever, and I look back, I, I question why I looked up to some of these people, but at the time, that's how it was. Um, and I learned from them, and I tried to take good things from them and throw away the bad things. And it, So I've seen how actual homicide investigations work. And they became cold because the detectives were not getting information in no more. There was no more leads to follow up. They found a hat at the crime scene. They tried to identify it, can't identify it, send it for DNA. DNA results come back that th there's nothing there. So that lead dries up. So initially it is a lead, but it goes nowhere. So then you move over to interviews and you interview all these people and it dries up. Nobody saw, saw anything. Nobody knows anything. So leads dry up. So you're not actively investigating the leads. You're not being proactive because now you were, but now you're pushing it off to the side of your desk because you got other cases that are coming in, whether they're homicides, whether they're robberies, burglaries, whatever they are. Um, and now you're becoming reactive, meaning, hey, Detective, line two, guy has information on your homicide from two weeks ago. Oh, okay. You're excited. Well, some people are, some not. Hey, let's talk. They give you that, the lead, whatever information. Hey, this person has knowledge. You go and interview that person and it turns out to be a bust. That's reactive. You're waiting for information to come in for you to go and, you know, get off your app and go work. Um, so eventually that case goes from the side of your desk, you know, behind the end of the filing cabinet it becomes cold. And then I come along, you know, 10 years later, Oh, this one looks interesting. It looks like that's something we can work. And then you start working it as a cold case investigator. And I've done that, uh, new, new, obviously numerous times. Some other things that I've learned about cool cases is that they are usually difficult. 
some people will look at a homicide detective who has solved, I don't know, let's just say 20 homicides in their 30 year career. And that is a success. And certainly would never want to take it away from that. But if you dig a little deeper and you look at those cases and you realize, you know, 15 of them were pretty easy. You know, 10 of them had eyewitness and camera capturing it, five DNA solved, and then three good eyewitness testimony, and then maybe two, you really went above and beyond. Um, but cold cases are cold because they're more difficult. That homicide investigator that just solved 20 cases, he couldn't solve it for whatever reason. They weren't cut and dry like his other 20 are. So then it makes the cold case investigator's job that much more difficult because you're trying to do something that maybe one, two, or three other detectives in the 50-year history of that case couldn't do. Well, there's a reason for that. One, there's probably no evidence. Two, no eyewitnesses. And so it becomes it becomes very difficult. So then what I try to do is work in all different types of methods. You know, not just looking at the evidence, not just going back and re-interviewing witnesses, but let's throw some criminal profiling in there. Let's try to whittle down what we have. You know, our suspect pool of one billion people. Well, we know that it's a male because the individual was sexually assaulted. Ooh, okay, well, that takes it down to a million people. Well, we know that they were from the area because a person saw the person leaving on a bike. Well, they surely didn't bike in 50 miles, so let's cut the radius down to 10 miles. Okay, so now we're dealing with a suspect pool of 1,000. So you see how we went from a billion suspects, could have been anybody, down to 1,000. That's the goal of a cold case investigator to use various methods in order to establish a, a pool and you're deducing possibilities to probabilities in order to get there. Now, some of these cold cases, over half of them, I believe are solved. Now, what that means is the investigators know who did it, but they can't prove it. happens a lot. It happens a lot. I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Um, could say Scott Peterson in a way. Yes, I know he's convicted. Um, but there was no other than like the, uh, the concrete stuff on his boat and him going. It was... It was the things that he said, the things that he did, that they knew right off the bat that he was not telling the truth. Now, let's say they would have never, and Scott Peterson might be a bad example because of the publicity, but let's, let's say they never would have found his boat and the concrete anchor stuff. He may have never been arrested, charged, convicted, because there just isn't enough evidence there. They know, based on X, Y, and Z, but that's not proof. You know, that may be like circumstantial evidence. So, now the reason I say Scott Peterson could be a wrong case is because it was so much in the public, that the pressure is on the police department to make an arrest. So, in fact, it, it, and it, it's a catch-22, too, because you want to have that e enough evidence there because the whole world's going to see it. 
So you don't want to have a flimsy case. But there's some prosecutors, some departments that would have never made that an arrest if it wasn't in the public's eye so much. Speaking of Scott Peterson, so I had a discussion with Bill Nagara. You guys remember Bill from my Redemption from Death Row series? And he was quote unquote friends with Scott Peterson in San Quentin. So he got to know Scott pretty well. And he told me a lot of stories in regards to Scott Peterson. Um, but Bill is a, he's a stand up guy. And um, because Scott Peterson never did him wrong, he, uh, I don't think will ever tell these stories publicly. Uh, but he did tell me in confidence some things. Um, and it just confirms some things that I know and you already know. So it's very interesting. But so when a cold case becomes cold, then a cold case investigator gets it and he starts working it. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, emotionally, it's very difficult because you're going back to these family members who now have had a lull in the case. They haven't had a detective come to their house and talk to them in maybe a decade. And it's bringing back all this emotion. And I've seen that ebb and flow a lot of times in cases that I've worked with the victims' families, and I always hate doing it. Um, I think of recently the Joanne Dunham video that I had done and her sister reaching out to me, and I felt so bad because it had been so long, 50, 60 years, and she sees this video on YouTube about her sister. She, you know, reaches out and I felt sad because, you know, she, you know, I don't want to get into personal details about, she just feels, feels like she could have done more, you know, and what type of sister is she for not pursuing this harder? And that's difficult. Um, so I, it's always 50, 50. And when you bring these cool cases back up, the victims, families, members, whether they want to, uh, th and how they want to perceive it and how they want to take that. You know, sometimes they'll take it as, I, I don't want to do anything anymore. I don't want this brought back up. And when that happens, these amateurs will jump on that. Oh, they're responsible. They're involved somehow. No. You have to understand human nature. And you have to understand how grieving the grieving process works and when you when you push it down and push it away for so long and then it's brought back up do you want that again you remember how it felt back then do you want that again you've moved on with your life you got your own family maybe you just don't want that brought up anymore so you start questioning it well because i don't want it brought back up because it was so hard does that make me a bad sibling? Does that make me a bad parent? Or maybe I should just continue to move on. It, it's a lot of emotions for these families. And some people just don't understand that. I had uh, a case I was getting ready to do a couple months ago. I, had, I have the police reports, researched it, um, put out a little teaser that I was going to do this because I was looking for a little bit more information and wanted to maybe interview a family member and the brother-in-law of the victim got a hold of me and said that he had talked to his brother, which was the victim's husband and stuff, and said that they would prefer that I didn't do the video. Now, I could have been a self-sufficient, self-absorbent jerk and said, hey, this is my job. I'm going to do it regardless. I mean, who are you? You're, you're not even immediate family. But I didn't. 
I ask that you reconsider. I understand where you're coming from, but this could help generate new leads, this and that. Um, they didn't want it. So I respect their wishes, you know? And that's the thing that we get away from, I think, not just in cool cases, but in society in general is, you know, kindness. Now, you look at me and you see the tattoos and some of my past videos where I'm very animated for good reason. I mean, uh, but never judge a book by its cover. At the heart of things, at the core of the matter, I am extremely kind person who wants that in society and I want to I want others to have that and consideration for others do unto others as you have others do unto you the golden rule that is the core principle of me and I think if more people had that I'm not saying more people should be like me because Lord knows we don't need a billion Kenny Mains is running around but I just think that you have to you have to look at things through other people's lenses. And when I did that, hey, I understand. Okay. Now I've run into a situation where one family member doesn't want it, but 25 do. Well, what do you do in that case? Well, for me, you know, I believe in democracy. So hey. I'm sorry. And I have ran into that. Uh, ran into it recently within the last couple of months with a, a local case that I did. And uh, you, I just went with the numbers. You know, you're always going to have people who are angry with you and don't like you. I've come to a realization that 50% of the population, give or take uh, 5%, are going to love you and going to hate you. No matter what. No matter what person. You look at uh, any presidential poll in the past, it's always just about 50, 50. You know, it's never like 80, 20. Uh, so you're always going to have that. And I've come to accept that and m just move on. But I go with numbers. And if most of the family members want me to, to do it, then I do it. Now, some cold cases that I investigate for the channel, people say, well, how do you come up with those? Um, sometimes I'll just get on the old newspapers. I'll pick a year. I love cold cases from the 70s and 60s. And I'll just get on a, a newspaper site from that year, search, you know, unsolved murders, whatever it is, and I'll, and I'll pick one. That's how I got... The latest deep dive I did for Nikki Benedict. Never heard of that case before. Found it in the newspaper. Seemed interesting. Seems like I could do a, a good crime scene assessment. Seemed everything was there. And so I did it. And it generated leads. Now, whether those leads are going to lead to an arrest or not, that's not up to me anymore. All I can do is pass them on. But cold cases, as I've said over time, um, time is a, it's an undefeated opponent. Time takes us all out, right? No matter what. Go back to Jerry Rice. All these football players that for 10 years are the best there is. They eventually, time catches up to them, and it's hard for them to retire. Brett Favre. Uh, right now, Aaron Rodgers is very hard for them to get out of that. Whether it's ego, pride, the spotlight, money, the competitiveness, whatever it is, time beats them. So, time in cold cases, you have to you have to take that and use it to your advantage. Meaning, if you have a suspect in 1967 when this crime was committed and their alibi is their girlfriend and they were 20 years old, well, now she's 70. She's not with him anymore. That's the opportunity to go strike, go re-interview. Because what you want to do is knock on that door, see that person, identify yourself, 
and have all those emotions flooding back to them of 50 years of guilt, remorse, all, and you see it on them, right? So you're using time to your advantage. They no longer have loyalties to that guy. They have grandkids of their own and things change. They see beauty and different things now than what they did then. So you use that to your advantage. Now, time also works against you in the degradation of evidence, eyewitnesses dying, landscapes, crime scenes changing. Sure, all that. But for me, I always look at the positives. What are the good things, not the negative things? You're always going to have negative things. But if you focus on the negative things, then I feel your production is negative. So you focus on the positive things. Yes, I know. <clears throat> Much like the Gail Matthews case, when I took that over, everybody, all the higher-ups, all the older detectives, all negative about it. Every one of them. Oh, you don't want to open up those can of worms. Oh, the evidence was destroyed. Oh, this and that. Oh. Half of the shit that they said wasn't even true. Okay? They were just afraid. They were cowards themselves. Um, just like the captain that was there when you know I was requested from the district attorney to work on it. And my captain's like, no. He, he doesn't have enough experience. Well, the district attorney felt otherwise. I had just solved a cold case. But you, in your ignorance, nobody's working it. Uh, you just didn't want a younger detective to make anybody else look bad. That's all it was. It was jealousy. Um, and I never forgot that. But I have learned to forgive. So. No matter how mad I get and still get when I think about that situation, I forgive. And I never used to be like that. I never, I always used to say my motto was, I don't forgive and I don't forget. Neither. Once you cross me, I'm done with you. Within the last year, my stance has softened on that. Um, doesn't mean I'm going to like you. Doesn't mean I'm going to hang out with you, but I forgive you. And that's the first step in recovery. <laughs> so it's baby steps for me, but I have learned to forgive. Um, let's go on to Ketty murders. A another case where time convolutes things. Because through time, these big cold cases become... You get a lot of falsehoods and you get a lot of amateurs that think they own the case and their theories is the way it is, even though when, even though they may be proved wrong. Um, this is a perfect example of that. Now, I've had some conversations with the surviving member of that immediate family that got wiped out and there are people that will point the finger at her and again you go back to the golden rule about being treated the way you want to be treated and the problem with today's YouTube and amateur detectives not all of them but some of them especially in this case though they come up with a narrative, a theory, based off of something that is probably credible. For example, let's say, in this case, Sheila Sharp's fingerprint being found on like a uh, the outside light bulb. You know what I mean? Like a porch light bulb that's unscrewed. And I think in this case it was unscrewed and her fingerprint was on it, and she's a surviving member. She spent the night at the next-door neighbor's, the night her family gets killed. So in the, in the broad, immediate sense, she's a potential suspect. You have evidence 
a fingerprint, a thumbprint on a light bulb that was unscrewed possibly during the course of this homicide. And she isn't murdered. So it's pretty good. But then when you start looking a little bit deeper at the crime scene, at the evidence, whether circumstantial or physical, you victimology on Sheila, she's a victim. Don't make no mistake about it. Just because she didn't die doesn't mean she isn't a victim. And then you can rule her out and say, hey, there is a reason for the two things. Her being alive, she went and spent the night, nothing nefarious about that. It was just coincidence, and I believe in coincidences. Um, and she put in that light bulb three years ago, whatever it is. So it can be explained away. But an amateur who has an agenda to get people to come to their website, get people to come to their YouTube page in order to make money, they'll stick with that narrative because why? It's sensational. It's like the National Enquirer used to be. I don't know even know if they still have that anymore. You know, you put these sensational headlines that have a tad bit of merit to it, but it gets blown out of proportion. That's what I see in this Ketty murders. The case can certainly be solved. Uh, I, I believe that it essentially, there's a lot of twists and turns in it that when I looked at the case, I didn't expect. Um, much like the little boy that was sleeping in there from next door I want to say his name is Jason, but I don't you know, call off the top of my head, but 10, 11-year-old boy or whatever he was, and his DNA being found on tape that was around Sue Sharp, that is an unexpected twist that I didn't see. But go back to what I said about taking something and then twisting it to fit your narrative. I am surprised, and I'm sure there probably is somebody out there that I just haven't caught wind of it yet, who will take that and say, he's the killer, like that little boy, because his DNA is on there. And then they start formulating an opinion, a theory about how that occurred with no basis of evidence or merit. But they'll make it fit. They'll say, well, there were reports, when there was none, but they'll use this. There were reports that Sue Sharp was sexually abusing this neighborhood boy or flirting with him and he got tired of it at even that that young age um, he was older than his age indicated and he attacked the family when it's complete and utter ludicrousy i mean any rational human being would understand that that's not, it's not logical. Possible? Sure. We always say, hey, it's possible. I go out there and there's a UFO in my backyard. It's not probable. It's the same with that theory. But because it's sensational and there's a tad bit of merit to it because of the DNA found on the tape, hey, let's, this is my theory. And now I'm going to go and be on the news. And I'm going to have people come to my site. And people fall for it. The public falls for that stuff. And they latch on to it. I just shake my head and, and think, well, these people vote. You know? We trust them in making my food. The cooks, right? It's a very good drink, by the way. I have to do that again tomorrow, maybe. So, anyhow, the Ketty murders. I It's a case that I'm still wanting to work on and do more with. And hopefully I, I get time this year in 2024 to do that. If you haven't seen my videos on that, please go and, 
and look at them. I do a deep dive on that where uh, I think it's, it's pretty in-depth. Um, let's step away from true crime just for a second and talk about Leonard Skinner because they're the best rock band of all time, in my opinion, at least my favorite. And I was watching a special about them the other night, really good documentary that was done about the plane crash. And um, I've had some contact with Craig Reed, who is a who was the roadie and guitar tech, I believe, for Leonard Skinner, and was on the plane crash. And he has a YouTube channel as well. And a lot of great stories about Leonard Skinner and with Gary Rossington, one of the three guitarists that just the last original member, original member in quotes, uh, that died. A great fan had sent me all of Gary Rossington's yearbooks because he had gone to school with and was friends with Gary. And as I was looking through them, I found a picture that I thought was Gary Rosington um, in his grade, but separated and said his name was Gay Cosington. And I was like, that's Gary Rosington. And I did a video on that. And you can look that up too as well. But um, I, I think I pretty much confirmed that that photograph in one of the yearbooks where Gary Rosington was supposed to be or was, wasn't there for pitcher day, he was. He was listed as Gay Cosington and in another section of the book, but it was him. And I always wondered whether it was because of somebody playing a prank on him or if they were couldn't read his handwriting and thought Gary Rosington meant Gay Cosington. But Craig Reed, when I'd sent it to him, he had said he used to call Gary Rosington Cosington all the time. So it just confirmed that to me I was correct in finding that. Doesn't matter, no, but I just I find it very neat. And I continue to listen to Leonard Skinner um, over and over again. And I, I don't know why <clears throat> I've been getting pulled more to. 70s music for New Year's. I had a playlist on for Bob Seeger. What a great musician he is! A great voice and great music. It reminds me of Skinner because song after song is good. It's not, it's almost like you can't find a bad song. Now, there were some songs by Leonard Skinner that you know don't think are their best like Georgia peaches you know I I don't really care for needle in the spoon although some people you know say that that's one of their best I just don't particularly like it but there's others that I like that others don't really listen to like my favorite probably Leonard Skinner song is four walls or Rayford a lot of people don't know that song, but it's one of my top five Leonard Skinner songs. So every time Freebird comes on, Freebird sometimes is much like Stairway to Heaven or any Led Zeppelin song. To me, Led Zeppelin is probably the greatest rock band of all time. Not my favorite, but probably the greatest. <coughs> and... Every time a Led Zeppelin song comes on the radio, Stairway to Heaven, Rock and Roll, Black Dog, Cashmere, whatever it is, I, I'll turn it. Not because it isn't great. It is great. But I've just heard it. They overdo it. And Freebird's the same way. But then when I just say, just stop, Kenny, and listen, and I let Freebird play, my daughter says, you go crazy doing that song. Because it is probably the best song of all time. And I'll skip over it. And I should never do that. It's just so great. But you guys know what I mean. You hear a song over and over again. 
And this, but it's different. If I have Freebird on my iPad, iPad or whatever, my phone, maybe I won't play it. But if a song comes on a radio, it seems like it's better for some reason because it surprises you that it comes on. I don't know. I digress. Leonard Skinner, my favorite band of all time. Um, I would have loved to have met Ronnie Van Zandt. I, I'd have loved to met, meet any of them. But one thing that I have learned, be careful what you wish for. Sometimes having them as your, not your hero or role model or anything like that, but somebody that you'd like to meet, sometimes it's best to stay that way instead of actually physically meeting them because you always seem seems to me you get disappointed anyhow somebody that i definitely would have liked to meet and it's weird to say it but i'd like to meet him on a professional level is ted bundy some people call him the greatest serial killer of all time and now greatest is not a moniker that should be put in front of the word serial killer but to me, he's intriguing. He offers a lot of insight, although some of the information that he gave towards the end of his life, he was still playing with police, and he still wasn't giving everything that he could have. Blaming his serial killing tendencies on pornography, I think that, that there was some truth to that, but I think it was a cop-out in a lot of ways. Him not willing to discuss some of his victims because, in my mind, he was ashamed that they were younger. Kimberly Leach and maybe uh, maybe the other girl when he was a teenager. Ann Burr, maybe, was her name. Um, even though I'm not sure that he did that. But he was still kind of evasive. You know, the guy's evasive throughout his killing career. But I, I was able to spend some time with the closest person that I knew to Ted Bundy, which was Kathy Reiner, Kathy Kleiner, who was a victim of Ted Bundy, but she survived the Chi Omega murders. A couple of her roommates were murdered and beaten, and she was beaten by Bundy as well, but he didn't kill her. Um, not that he didn't try. But you, I, I can't learn anything. I, I learned a lot about victim survival and to move on from Kathy Kleiner for sure. But I couldn't learn anything about Ted Bundy. She didn't know Ted Bundy, right? She's just a victim. So I would like to sit down with Ted Bundy and really... Some of these interviewers, I believe, were intimidated by Bundy and afraid to ask some questions. I would like to sit down and be like, all right, Ted, this is what I know. So explain to me why you did this. What was the urge that you had inside that you could push down for a little bit, but it popped back up? Why did it pop back up? Was is it, What triggered that? Was it seeing that? long brown hair black haired uh girl with the part in the middle is that all it took or was it because she had to be successful she had to be a college person because you looked down upon women you didn't feel that they you felt that you were superior to all women so any girl that was professional meaning college educated had a job, that's who you went after. You felt that prostitutes were not worthy of, of your time. Those are the questions that I would want to ask Ted Bundy, right? Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, Ted Bundy was killed and you'll never get to answer those questions. We won't get into the death penalty and my thoughts on that here. I've been somewhat vocal about that in the past, but I'm sure we'll get to it. Um, I'm not, I'm not extremely opinionated. 
You know, like I, I'm not going to get on here and talk about politics um, or religion, even though I have my own beliefs and I follow that. I just, I don't like to push an agenda. I don't like to tell people because I don't like people telling me the way I should vote or what the way I should look. I mean, obviously, I don't like to look at me. I, I feel that you, your own person, make up your own mind. I'm just not a very opinionated person. I have my beliefs. I'll tell them, but not to the point where I'm shoving it down your throat uh, or anything like that. Uh, so Ted Bundy. Fascinating case study. If you haven't looked, I did like a week series on Ted Bundy as well. I go through every single one of his murders. Um, I thought it was very educational. He's somewhat oversaturated the market, so to speak, but it's for good reason. Just like Stairway to Heaven oversaturated the market but there's a reason for that because it's good Bundy is because he's intriguing okay you can learn a lot from him in regards to serial murders the human nature side the psychology side of a murderer um, very fascinating that's it I don't even know how long we've been going here almost an hour so that's about what I wanted, about an hour a day, sit and talk about all things. What did we cover today? Jeez, healthcare system, Ted Bundy, Ketty Murders, Leonard Skinner, Led Zeppelin, cold cases, my disdain for some old detectives. That right there is... I shouldn't even, I never thought I would say that. I've always been and still am always respectful to my elders that I could learn from. But after I've, after I've gotten older and can look back and look at some of the things that they said, did, taught, um, I don't know, some of them, not all of them, but some of them that I worked with. Uh, lost my respect, but I still love them all. I'm learning that as well. So listen, you're not going to like everybody in life and not everybody's going to like you. Uh, the big difference I think sometimes is a lot of people pretend and they're fake and that bothers me. Nothing bothers me more than a fake person. I've seen that in, in the cold case organization I ran. I've seen it in police officers. I've seen it in regular people. You know, so nice to your face or whatever, and then behind closed doors that somebody else, they backstab you or talk about you. And then you confront them about it, at least I do, because I, I've always been that way. I always will confront um, inequities and injustices all the time. And then, oh no, everything's fine. I no, I didn't say that. I, and then I used to be done with them, not talking to them, done with them, but trying to be a better person and I forgive them. So there's a lot of people out there that I've forgiven recently. Doesn't mean I'm going to call them up and be buddies and buddies with them. But, hey, I forgive them. I can't harbor all of that anger. And that's what a lot of it, it was. And I think that's one of the reasons I ended up leaving my job at the district attorney's office is because I was becoming very confrontational, meaning I, I never s s sought it out. But when there was something wrong, I didn't shy away. I didn't cower away no matter who it was. Higher than me, lower than me. I'm going to walk into your office. I'm going to be respectful. But I'm going to be con confrontational. 
meaning, hey, you're going to explain this to me, and I'm going to give you my opinion. Perfect example was, you know, I ran an undercover narcotics unit. We had an office, but our office, unfortunately, was located in a, a downtown area where parking was limited. So we have 13, 14 vehicles, undercover vehicles that we have to park different places and move them constantly because we don't have a dedicated parking lot. We have to park out in the street. We have to park in private parking lots, wherever we are. And this, I see now almost slipped again and said this idiot, but I won't. This parking authority manager goes to the newspaper and says that parking is a big problem in, in this area. And most of it, the problem is the narcotics unit. I uh, see, I'm still getting angry and I, I got to come, come down, right? You just told all these drug dealers now in the newspaper where our undercover cars are in this area. So they're going to come down, take pictures, take videos. They don't think of that. They only think about, that's why I say idiot. You run your mouth, you spout it off to the newspaper before you know the repercussion. So what did I do? I marched right over to his office, throw down a newspaper, and say, what the were you thinking? Did you just know you just put all my men in jeopardy? by running your mouth about something that you could have handled with me. So I became confrontational for good reason. It's not like I'm just walking down the street and become confrontational. You know, I'm not looking for it. But maybe there was a better way of me handling that. Um, so I seem to have done that a lot towards the end of my career. And if I could change anything, it would probably be going back and not being so confrontational. Um, hey, we live and we learn, we grow. Um, if you're not growing, you're dying. I learn something new every day. And uh, all you can do is try to become a better person. Become, Treat others, <clears throat> as long as you go by that rule, treat others as you have others treat you. And uh, I try to do that. I'm still not ready to integrate with society yet, meaning I still love my seclusion. And I don't really want to go out and I just feel uncomfortable being with large groups of people or even small groups of people that I don't know. I don't like it. I've always been that way. It's just become worse over the years. Maybe it's because I'm distrustful, whatever it is. Um, but it doesn't mean I'm going to be confrontational. I was out to eat the other week, and I ran into the waitress says, hey, you're Ken Maines. I know you from uh, your YouTube videos and whatever you need. I left her a big tip because she was very friendly, and I always tip well anyhow, and, you know, did the things that I you took a picture and you know be nice that's all so I'm trying hard to be better that way not to cuss so much that was a big problem I had in the beginning of my videos um, getting frustrated and angry and then cursing there's no need for that you can get your point across without doing that so I look back at some of those videos that I've done and a little bit embarrassed about how I conducted myself, but sometimes passion really takes over. But you got to be able to control that, All right? Well, that's it for today. Back tomorrow with a whole new agenda for True Detective Talk Live. Thanks for hanging out. Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, I hope your new year is full of happiness. Okay, enjoy. Spend time with your family because you never know when you're not going to be able to do that anymore. So with that said, hey, thanks for watching. Mains out.